Hey guys, what's up? Hey guys, what's up? Lex Tango here to talk about Call of Duty, but for those of you who have missed my Funkadelic intro and my Red Winged Dagger, and of course my impeccable news coverage, I've been AFK because I had to move from this state all the way down to this state, and I was also working on a new channel with some friends of mine called Dead Ops Regiment. It's where I store all of my funniest clips and moments on classic Call of Duties with my friends. I also post memes that we make with the use of those old Call of Duties. So if you like classic COD and you like funny videos, you should really go check it out and subscribe. But the news we are about to get into today could essentially be summed up as Modern Warfare 2 and Warzone 2's player count numbers are in, and they're not very good. It could be that simple, but there is so much more to it, and in this video we are going to break down the significance of these numbers and why this particular data hasn't been readily available for the past eight Call of Duties, and what is finally being revealed about the current state of Call of Duty, which absolutely decimates the gaslighting that suggests that everyone is really loving this new era of COD. We will also have some classic Call of Duty multiplayer going on in the background because that's what I've been playing in the absence of Modern Warfare 2022. Now, for those of you who followed along in 2020 and 2021, me and a few other YouTubers looked deeply at the limited data that was being made available by Activision and deduced that sales were going up because of very expensive and intensive marketing campaigns. But once people got their hands on the game, player retention and playtime for every individual COD player was actually going down. And that was very controversial. A lot of hardcore fanboys didn't want to hear that about the health of the franchise. But that's where all the findings were kind of pointing in complete contrast of what spokespeople for Activision were suggesting. Shortly put, the problem was very, very good marketing for a not so good product. So some of that deduction came in the form of looking at overall COD monthly active users across you know, all Call of Duties, which was in fact a chart Activision did release, but they wouldn't release uh, player data on any individual Call of Duty because they wanted things like Warzone and COD Mobile to be included in that massive number so that it looked really good. But eventually they did release some charts specifically for Warzone or specifically for COD Mobile, then we could deduct that from the numbers on the overall chart and kind of get an idea of how regular Call of Duty was actually doing. You had to do a lot of uh, digging and reading between the lines, which they didn't expect or want people to do. And this sometimes frustrating process was all because they were withholding direct player count data that could show very easily what player retention was actually like in these games as in live player counts, average player sessions, and so on, and how long those numbers go on before they falter or rise over time to determine accurately how well player retention is or is not doing. So to better understand the significance of what's happening today, let's go back to the beginning where this all started. When Call of Duty was on the rise every single year, you can bet your ass that there would be a global player counter in your multiplayer menu, because those numbers were something to be proud of. I remember hopping onto Black Ops 1 and seeing anywhere from 300,000 to 600,000 players, one time peaking at around 1 million players online, and that was just on PlayStation 3. And those numbers may seem high for any individual console, but Black Ops 1 was not only one of the best-selling Call of Duties of all time, but it also had some of the best player retention in Call of Duty's history, coming in third place underneath the original Modern Warfare 2 and Modern Warfare 3's player retention. And we know this because it had a player counter, and we could see live player counts in the years that followed. I mean, hell, in 2020, Black Ops 1 on Xbox reached a live player count of 270,000 leading up to Cold War's release. Now, 2011 to 2013, Modern Warfare 3 and Black Ops 2 tended to always have pretty healthy and at times impressive numbers, but Call of Duty Ghost struggled. It hit a slum of just 50,000 players on PlayStation in the January right after its release, and everyone could see it. So, when Advanced Warfare came out, Activision removed the live player counter from that point on. This was a purely defensive move by Activision because after Black Ops 2, they saw the franchise declining and they were afraid that if it continued to decline, which it most certainly did, that very blunt data of live player counts could be a damaging red flag for their investors, let alone the Call of Duty community. The next issue Activision faced, however, was the fact that people playing on Steam through the Steam server client could find the live player count data for Call of Duty within the Steam application, which is why Battle.net propriety for PC players became such a crucial and adamant goal. 
because when people played through Battle.net, there was no way to access live player count data because Activision refused to make it available. So after this, Activision's defensive tactics essentially became, let's pump as much money into you know the marketing budget for these upcoming Call of Duties as we can, uh, get as many people to buy them right off the bat, and then essentially gaslight our fans and our investors that everything is going according to plan, everything's fine, the franchise is healthier than it's ever been, even if that really wasn't the case. And with Activision withholding data critical to these claims, it was hard to challenge this sort of gaslighting in the absence of the data that would easily disprove them. So that absence didn't just create room for Activision spokespeople to gaslight, but also deniers of Call of Duty's downfall and, of course, Activision fanboys to claim things were you know better than they actually were. And a lot of people like that would then challenge others to prove otherwise. And with the very limited, cherry-picked, carefully presented data that Activision was putting out there, and only that data, it was really tough to read between the lines and figure out what was really going on, let alone prove it to people who just didn't want to believe that there was a problem. Now, you may be wondering, uh, what type of data did they show investors to keep them convinced or optimistic in place of data such as average player time and live player count? Well, they had to switch to data charts that they could easily present in a misleading way, where they could have full control over how to manipulate it in their presentation to affect the perception of their investors the exact way they wanted to, obviously in a more positive light than anything else. The major numbers they focused on was initial game sales, on which included pre-orders and the number of sales shortly after a new game's release, microtransactions, because if you're making enough extra money, investors could give a rat's ass if your community or player retention is declining, and a very broad measurement of player count known as monthly active users. So let's start with monthly active users. This number included anyone who so much as opened the game menu on their game system within the last 30 days. So if you opened up the game menu but didn't actually play the game for the rest of the month, you were still considered a monthly active user. If you opened up the game by accident before going and playing a completely different game for the rest of the month, you were still considered a monthly active user. But MAU charts, though misleading, usually provides a very big number to show investors and that's all Activision cared to do. And I shouldn't have to explain too deeply why their charts on initial game sales are misleading if they're presented with the purpose of convincing you that player retention is doing good, because all pre-orders and initial game sales really shows is how successful your $200 million marketing campaign was able to persuade consumers to buy your game. It is a very misleading presentation, especially when you consider Black Ops 1 spent $17 million on its marketing and sold roughly 19 million copies by Christmas. Modern Warfare 2022 spent $200 million on its marketing and sold an estimated 21 million copies by Christmas. Similar to Modern Warfare 2019, they had to spend over 10 times as much on their marketing as Black Ops 1 just to compete with it and beat its records. They spent 10 times as much on marketing to get a 10 to 15% edge over Black Ops 1's game sales. Activision has lost so much trust and optimism from its fans, it has become so much harder and way more expensive to make us excited or optimistic about a game. It's to the point where they have to invest 10 times as much in trying to convince us to buy the game to achieve similar numbers as they did in the past. I mean, just take a second and imagine how much more Black Ops 1 would have sold if it had a $200 million marketing campaign instead of its mere $17 million. Persuading us into believing the next upcoming COD is going to be good enough to buy is now the most expensive part of making a Call of Duty. But now, after breaking down the history of this issue as well as breaking down misleading statistics, let's take a look at Steam's numbers for Modern Warfare 2 and Warzone 2. As you can see, they do not show the games individually, they show them collectively, and with both of those games combined, they are still dipping below Apex Legends, which is a four-year-old game, and a lot of people even call it a dead game. The sadder part about this is Warzone, as a free game, always has more than 10 times as many active players than any $70 main title Call of Duty which means Modern Warfare 2022 makes up less than 10% of this overall number, which is probably why they have them combined, because then that is easier to hide. That means that less than three months after launch, Modern Warfare 2022's player retention is doing worse than Call of Duty's Ghosts, which is actually worse when you think about it, because Modern Warfare 2022 sold more copies than Call of Duty Ghosts did.
And before you say, well, maybe not that many people bought the game for PC. I'm sorry, that's just hella incorrect. Steam reported that Modern Warfare 2022 had the largest initial game sales out of any other Call of Duty in history, with almost 9 million units sold so far out of an estimated 23 million copies across all platforms. It has currently sold more copies in Steam than have been sold in PlayStation or Xbox individually. The player count for Modern Warfare 2 and Warzone 2 dropped below the player count seen before Warzone 2 was released. Within two and a half months, we saw the release of Warzone 2 and Season 1 for Modern Warfare 2 and Warzone 2. And they are now dipping below their starting point. Which means with all the brand new content, the player retention is not existent. And instead of just going back to where they started, they're actually losing the community. And look, this decline isn't new. This has been going on with COD for a while now. It's just we finally have access to the data that shows it plainly and bluntly. Now you see why they were fighting so hard to control this type of data and prevent it from being made public. And listen, I'm simply just going over the numbers. I don't have a real opinion on my own regarding the multiplayer experience in Modern Warfare 2022. I haven't really sat down and played it. I played the campaign. I enjoyed the campaign. I let Joel Emsley know that the campaign is beautiful. It's visually pleasant because it is. But unfortunately, like Vanguard, I had no desire to really get into the multiplayer. I didn't even buy Vanguard. I only bought Modern Warfare 2022 because I really wanted to play the campaign. And I've been having way too good of a time playing old Call of Duties like World at War, Black Ops 1, Black Ops 2, Modern Warfare 3 on Plutonium to even give too much of a thought about Modern Warfare 2022's multiplayer. The past two years of just playing dedicated servers of classic Call of Duties made by the Call of Duty community has literally had me in moments where I forget which Call of Duty we're on right now. I will sometimes just forget about whatever main title Call of Duty is out altogether. I've just completely lost interest, and by looking at the data, I can see that I'm not the only one that feels that way, including a lot of people who obviously bought the game, played it, and have stopped playing it. Now, I am going to try the multiplayer soon, and I will have my own opinion about the game, and that may be a completely different video, but this particular video was purely about the significance of the type of data that we, for the first time in eight years, now have direct access to for a current main title Call of Duty. That's all I got. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, comment down below, keep the conversation going, and I will catch you guys next time.